Hello and welcome to the Alatea Foundation's new podcast series, where experts share their insights on current and urgent energy matters for the benefit of our members and the general community. My name is Stephen Cole, and I'm joined today by Dr. Axel Wittfeld, who is the CEO of Uniper Hydrogen and has been president of Gas Storage Europe. Dr. Axel, welcome and thank you very much for taking the time out to join us for what I'm sure will be an excellent and an informative interview. Good afternoon, Stephen, and thanks for having me. Uh, you're welcome. For the benefit, particularly perhaps for our non-European listeners, can you tell us how Uniper came into being? Uh, yes, of course. Um, most of the listeners will, will know Uniper um, partially, perhaps, uh, for the history with uh, E.ON and, and, um, and Ruhrgas. In 2016, E.ON and Uniper decided to spin off Uniper from, uh, from E.ON. And we're an international energy company with around 12,000 um, employees in more than 40 countries. Um, we plan to make our power generation CO2 neutral in Europe by 2035. So there is a, a pretty um, determined strategy towards uh, decarbonization. Our business um, encompasses uh, power generation, um, but Unipa is also among the largest global um, suppliers of natural gas. Uh, we are involved in energy trading, um, including um, LNG trading and um, LNG supplies. Um, we also procure, store, transport and supply um, commodities. And um, I think what is our speciality is combining technical and commercial capabilities. Um, combined with our decarbonization strategy, uh, we follow a pretty innovative route. And um, that also encompasses um, hydrogen activities um, on a global scale along the entire value chain. But I assume um, that will be the, the core of our discussion, what exactly we are doing in hydrogen. Exactly, exactly that. Um, uh, just before we, we, we move into um, the issue of hydrogen uh, and the different colours of hydrogen, uh, just a little bit, if you will, Axel, to tell us about your own career. For example, you have a doctorate, I know, from the Institute of Energy Economics at the Technical University at Cottbus in Germany. Um, that's correct. After my studies in um, industrial engineering, I uh, wanted to specialize more and uh, to continue the um, academic um, approach. And so my doctorate is in energy economics. And I assessed um, demand side management uh, programs um, in Europe. So that was uh, some an assessment that, um, of course, you can balance supplies and supplies of power generation and, and gas are flexible. Um, but they also there's a demand response, which might be commercially beneficial instead of always um, adapting the supplies. And uh, assessing that and arguing um, in favor of that, that was the core of my doctorate. And, and you then held a series of positions um, which were mostly gas storage and gas supply related until you were asked to start up a completely new business line for Uniper, and that is to manage a new hydrogen business, which was only established, what, a year ago? Well, last summer. So new challenges and an exciting time for you. That is correct. Um, in my career, I've, um, I've done several positions in, in operations, but also in business development. Therefore, this, this idea of creating something new, um, I'm quite familiar with that. Um, also, because uh, you are absolutely correct, we um, established this new business line. However, um, Uniper had started um, hydrogen activities already 10 years ago. Um, this was with some pilot activities, so we erected um, some assets for producing green hydrogen in Germany, uh, small scale, just to test the waters, uh, get to know the technology better and um, understanding um, the commercial impact of that. So based on that, we then um, <clears throat> rediscussed our strategy and combined with the decarbonization approach, we said, my goodness, there is a global momentum, an unprecedented momentum for hydrogen. 
Yeah. And we should make use of that. There's the market for it. Our customers are asking for it. And Juniper is well positioned with the um, um, existing capabilities we have got, in particular in the natural gas business. And consequently, we said, let's let's bundle all hydrogen activities in, in Juniper. Let's foster it. Um, let's uh, form a proper team. And um, then let's uh, somehow take it from there and give it a new momentum a new spin in hydrogen. And uh, by the way, meanwhile, uh, we also have the task to handle hydrogen, not only for Uniper, but also for its uh, major shareholder, i.e. Fortum. Okay. So um, tell us a bit about the, the nature of the new business. Uh, will Uniper store hydrogen for other producers or will Uniper be a hydrogen producer in its own right? Well, both. Um, well, first of all, we intend to build, own, and operate hydrogen production facilities in Europe. And in the long term, elsewhere as well, which means beyond Europe. Um, we also plan to become increasingly active in hydrogen trading worldwide. Um, we expect hydrogen trading to become as global as natural gas and LNG trading already are. And uh, this would be good for decarbonization, and also represent an exciting opportunity for um, Unipa, because being one of Europe's largest natural gas importers, traders and marketers, that gives us the expertise to do the same um, with hydrogen. So it's already central to our strategy and uh, we intend to be active on the asset side, which means hydrogen production and storage, but also on the, let's call it hydrogen as a commodity side. So trade and supply hydrogen in, in future. Okay. Um, and the the glue that combines it would be that we are also looking into um, import facilities of hydrogen in Europe. Yeah. So what kind of adaption strategies do you think Gulf producers uh, can adapt in dealing with the challenge of this huge energy transition? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course, that is extremely relevant, in particular for the for the producers of natural gas in the Middle East. Yeah, because that um, um, that is the core of their strategy. And, and I believe an adaptation towards decarbonization is key, which means um, green hydrogen. There are ample of opportunities in the Middle East, but also um, decarbonize hydrogen, which doesn't have to be necessarily green. I think there are a lot of opportunities um, for Middle East producers to somehow green their products, um, their current trading, such as natural gas and LNG. And um, I, I see that Uniper has changed its plans for more LNG imports at Wilhelmshaven and will instead change its use towards uh, a, a hydrogen hub, perhaps, by importing green ammonia. Can you tell us more about uh, those plans, please? Yeah, that's um, that's correct. Well, Wilhelmshaven is in the northwest of Germany, a deep sea port. And originally, we explored the idea of constructing a floating import terminal for LNG at the Wilhelmshaven site. Um, however, last year, a market test to show binding interest Proof that there is currently not enough interest in the LNG sector in terms of booking large long-term capacities for LNG regasification in Germany. And um, well, consequently, we, we thought, well, what else is, is important? And um, given our strong hydrogen ambitions, and given the fact that in continental Europe, we will need um, large amounts of hydrogen in the future. We will partly produce the hydrogen ourselves, of course, but we will be dependent on imports. Okay. And that was the starting point of the uh, project, which we call Green Willemshaven. And there are mainly two pillars. One pillar is the um, production of green hydrogen in Willemshaven, because we are close to, for example, offshore wind farms. And the other pillar is to erect an import facility for importing hydrogen. Well, as we all know, there are several ways of transporting hydrogen, uh, several ways of, of carriers. Uh, there is methanol, there is um, liquefied hydrogen, and there is ammonia. 
And we currently believe that ammonia is probably technically and commercially the best option. And consequently, um, the idea, which we have already started with feasibility studies, of erecting an import facility um, in, in Wilhelmshaven. And the order of magnitude would be um, roughly that we could serve about 10% of the German hydrogen demand in 2030. Okay. And that hydrogen will be used for both local customers. Um, there, is, there is industry nearby. There is the, the port nearby. Um, but of course, there's also the intention that we would inject this uh, climate-friendly hydrogen into the, into the hydrogen grid and then supply um, all over Germany with it. So will there be a trading market for hydrogen then, rather like TTF for gas? Absolutely. Absolutely. I genuinely believe that um, hydrogen will develop into a um, liquid commodity. Um, not this year and not next year. Um, but it will come over time. And I'm convinced that, uh, let's say, in 10 years' time, uh, we will see a liquid market uh, for hydrogen. And um, once we, we combine and bundle the existing projects that are more regionally based, um, I'm convinced that this would lead um, into a, a proper trading market for hydrogen. Um, in the beginning, um, potentially on a, on a local level, but after all, on an international and global level. And, and of course, we, we talk and you alluded uh, a little bit earlier to the various colours of hydrogen, grey, blue and, of course, green, all corresponding, as you know, to different production processes. Will hydrogen now be distinguished by its colour and price differentials, or will there eventually be such an abundance of green hydrogen that the other colors will simply go away, disappear? Hmm. Well, um, I believe we need the full rainbow of colors, i.e. green, blue, turquoise. Of course, gray hydrogen will remain. Um, however, that's the, the um, let's call it conventional hydrogen, quite CO2 intensive and consequently um, it's not on the list of Uniper strategy. And our list is, um, first and foremost, green hydrogen, which is produced by electrolysis equipment, powered by zero carbon renewable um, electricity, and that is obviously um, very promising. However, still um, relatively expensive. Um, so well, if it, if it is relatively expensive, when do you think the time will come it'll make financial sense for companies to invest in green hydrogen? And will, will it be cost or what will be the factors that drive those investments? Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to, to give you a number about, uh, you know, in X years. Um, if I had to give a number, I would probably say in 10 years, uh, it might be um, commercially viable. Um, the question is, what needs to happen to make it commercially viable? And there are several factors. Um, for one, we need a proper political and regulatory framework and incentive scheme. On the customer side, for example, we need incentives to purchase green hydrogen. Now, green hydrogen, no, sorry, now gray hydrogen um, is economically more feasible, but with increasing CO2 prices, um, decarbonized hydrogen would be more attractive also for the customers. What else has to happen? On the production side, we have to reduce costs. And the costs on the production sides are one, um, the price of electricity. That's a big part of it, of the operational expenditures. For that, we need um, a maturing renewable energy market. And here again, the Middle East is a perfect place because with the fantastic resources for renewables, it's a great location to produce cheap renewables and use those renewables for producing green hydrogen and then using it in the Middle East or exporting it um, to other continents, for example, in, uh, in Europe. If we reflect on the, on the OPEX, we also have to consider the, the capital expenditures for electrolysis. And there, um, of course, with um, increasing um, numbers and increasing size of the assets, we will see economies of, of scale that will automatically come. 
And as we start more and more projects and equipment manufacturers start producing stacks of electrolysis on larger scale, so that will speed up the economy. So in a nutshell, on the customer side, incentives by regulation, and on the production side, we need cheap electricity and uh, we need to reduce the capex further. Okay, so um, I, I think you'll agree, we expect that most generation grids will need some firm generation capacity. This is largely supplied now by gas in Europe. Do you think that hydrogen produced by green electricity will one day become a reserve fuel rather like grid battery? Um, yes, I believe that the, the utilization of, of electrolysis and also of other forms of hydrogen, for example, blue hydrogen, which will be an important factor um, as well, um, that this will have um, high utilization hours in future and therefore hydrogen will be a reliable source. In addition, um, we have got the opportunity of storing hydrogen in existing gas storage um, assets. Of course, we have to retrofit them partially, um, but definitely this is a great business model for system storage um, operators to store hydrogen in future, to make use of, of balancing markets and to provide security of supply. I'm aware that currently um, hydrogen is particularly discussed for um, as you call it, uh, you know, like a grid battery, um, that hydrogen is discussed as make use of excess um, electricity and use then the cheap electricity to produce hydrogen. And this will happen. Um, this will also um, avoid the curtailment of wind farms and of, uh, of solar farms. But hydrogen will be a lot more and I'm convinced that it will be a reliable supplier of, of energy in future. And as I understand it, green hydrogen is truly is only really truly sustainable as it's, as it's the only one that doesn't generate additional carbon emissions. But uh, we've got to move on from um, uh, green hydrogen because I, I just wonder sort of as we come to the end of this podcast, you can tell us a bit more about your work as president of Gas Storage Europe. Mm. Well, Gas Storage Europe is part of Gas Infrastructure Europe. Gas Infrastructure Europe is an association gathering about 70 energy infrastructure operators from 26 European countries. And Gas Infrastructure Europe members work and innovate with low carbon and renewable molecules. And this includes hydrogen, of course, um, but also natural gas and biofuels. Our members are active in transmission pipelines, in LNG terminals, and in storage facilities. And this is now the part where I'm president of, of Gas Storage Europe. And the objectives of this association um, comprise mainly contributing to a safe and reliable European storage system, um, promoting market solutions for our customers, um, contributing to the setting of a stable public policy framework and also voicing the opinion of its members in Europe and um, approaching European bodies of regulators and other stakeholders and European institutions. So somehow bundle the voice of storage system operators um, in Europe and um, then discussing it with relevant stakeholders. That, that's quite a wide brief. Um, OK, so finally, Axel, uh, the big question. Um, when will Uniper be carbon neutral? In 2035, we intend to be a carbon neutral in Europe. That's very impressive uh, and not far away for a deadline. It's funny how these deadlines rush towards us. <laughs> that's time. right. Time flies, <laughs> yes. Axel, uh, I believe that's all we have time for today on behalf of the Ala Tia Foundation. I'd like to thank you very much for joining me for this interview and providing the foundation with your excellent insights. And I look forward to hearing from you again in the future.